Welcome. Uh, I'm Will Green. I'm a professor of landscape architecture here at URI. I want to welcome everyone uh, to our second lecture uh, for the semester. I want to thank those who support the lecture series through their generous financial contributions. They include the Rhode Island chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects, Landscape Forms, College of the Environment and Life Sciences, and the GP Faella Endowment. I also want to thank uh, two of our students, Seth Boyce, who's helping uh, with our technology. Without him, this won't work. And I want to thank uh, Maria Church for organizing our uh, reception uh, for all of you. So make sure everyone gets something to eat and drink. Um, this evening, we will be streaming live and on YouTube. Thanks to Seth. Following the talk, if you have any questions, if you're in here, raise your hand. Uh, you'll be recognized if uh, you're listening from the outside and watching this, uh, there will be a chat space for you to ask questions or make comments, and we'll try to accommodate you. This year, we have asked speakers to share their thoughts on current practice and communication. Uh, Carolina Aragon is well positioned to speak on this topic. As an artist, a designer, and an academic. Uh, she has a Master's of Landscape Architecture from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University and a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Savannah College of Art and Design. Since receiving her Master's, she's practiced a landscape architecture at firms on the East Coast and the West Coast. She's worked with Martha Schwartz and land design, and on the West Coast, Walker Macy. She started teaching as a lecturer at Smith College in 2012, and in 2015 was appointed as, a, as an assistant professor of landscape architecture and planning at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst where she is now an associate professor. Uh, Carolina, Carolina is a public artist and a member a num with a number of public art installations, including one named Future Shoreline, which was placed at Fort Point Channel in Boston. And it resulted in her receiving a climate change communication award Rebecca Balestra, winner in 2021, the same year she received a Distinguished Community Engagement Award for research from the University of Massachusetts and a BSLA Merit Award in Communications for four art installations about sea level rise in Boston. In 2018, she received a CODA Awards honor for the best site specific for the best site specific artwork given by Interior Design Magazine. She has a host of other credits for exhibitions, art installations, and commissions. She has published papers and chapters and been selected as a creative revolutionary by the CODA Rocks organization in 2020. Uh, this is quite, uh, it's a, quite a pleasure to read this and to discover this about you. And I'd like to welcome you and we'd like to welcome you to URI. Once you get any feedback, just turn off on the screen on the left. Second on the microphone. If you get feedback there. Can you hear me? Yes. From here? Or can you still hear me? Wow, it works. Wonderful. Thank you, Will. What a beautiful introduction. It was really moving. Um, 
Thank you also for the invitation to be here tonight. I have never been to Kingston. I've never been to URI, and I was just delighted, just even if it was a couple of hours, just to sort of see the, your beautiful campus and to reconnect with some of my beloved colleagues and friends that I see only on conferences uh, from time to time. Ha, okay, we're gonna do this. Thank you for being here. I know it's a Tuesday evening and you have other choices, so it means a lot to me that you're physically present here in this space. Um, okay, I am going to talk to you in a very chatty way because that's just who I am and that's okay about my work for the last 12 years. And I wanna talk about it in the context of um, how art can, be a tool for us to better connect with the world we live in, with the people that are around us, and to hopefully help us also better um, imagine and understand uh, what the future holds. So um, I'm going to start with this concept of home. So this is my trajectory. I am from Cali, Colombia, uh, from the tropics. And it's sort of interesting to me to kind of begin to tell you, okay, these are all the places that I have called home in my lifespan. And I say this not because, oh, well, I'm an immigrant and I'm Latina and all these things, although that is also true. But I do this with the intention of reflecting about how all of us in some way or another are experiencing the feeling of being an immigrant. How many of you live in the same place that your parents grew up? Some of you, wonderful. How many of you live in the same place that your grandparents grew up? Good for you, a couple, but most of us are not. Will you live your whole lives here? Maybe, maybe not, right? And even if you did, with the way that our world is currently changing, it is likely that the landscapes that we have known or that our people, our ancestors have known are not gonna be the same, right? So we're kind of in this moment of shifting what, what used to be given to us as a baseline, right? We've all heard that I used to start planting my plants in mid-June because that's when it was to warm up in New England, <laughs> right? And now we know that that's not true. So this idea of the shifting landscape, either because we're physically moving through the world or because the world is changing, is something that we all are grappling with somehow. And so um, over time, because of my own experience, I have used R to connect to the places in which I've been living, to make sense of it, to really get to know a place. And so I'll start telling you the story of my first project 12 years ago, uh, which happened in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And as you know, many of you know, like many places along the East Coast, Chelsea is, um, you know, it used to be part of the, you know, Harbor uh, Island. And, and it, there, there's a lot of that land that is the result of landfill. So land that did not used to be land, land that used to be marsh or used to be water, right? And so for that project, we begin to imagine um, how do we use a public space to tell a story about what the original landscape of the city was, right? And so we wanted to bring attention to uh, a particular historical event of the Battle of Chelsea Creek and how that, um, that was an important battle of the Revolutionary War, um, how that was won because the natives had, uh, the people that lived there had a better understanding of the tidal fluctuation. And so how do we turn this like very, you know, kind of like day-to-day -day environment into uh, a landscape that speaks about marsh? So we're like, okay, can we, can you imagine these like uh, sort of uh, green spaces in the, in the center of town and islands? And if we took those islands, the edges of those islands and create a marshland, what would that look like? And so we, we made this installation uh, with tomato steaks, a thousand tomato steaks that we spray painted red um, for impact, nothing else, <laughs> and sheets of uh, mylar that we sewed to create the illusion of water, 
right? I've been trying to tell people I've been trying to make water for at least 15 years, maybe longer. Um, I don't get tired of it. Um, and, and, it, and it's obviously this is not water, right? This is all man-made, but it's it's about making these landscapes with people that live in these places, uh, with youth that lives in these places to tell a story. It is also an exercise on helping all of us and, and, and recent immigrants like this group here. I work with a group of young mothers who uh, are recent immigrants from Nicaragua, Honduras, and Costa Rica to kind of understand the place that they are now living in, right? When you move to the United States and uh, you just arrived, you just have to cover your bare necessities. Like where do you get your food? How do you get to work? Who takes care of your kids? I mean, there's very little room for understanding the history of a place unless you go to school, right? Because you're just in survival mode. So by kind of introducing, you know, do, through through the arts, right? You kind of in, increase uh, kind of the the way in which all of us can not just understand the history of this place, but also actively modify a public space, which is such a powerful tool. Um, for this project, we also had some, we worked with middle school students in creating narratives about the history of Chelsea Creek and about some of the environmental concerns that were happening in the area and made um, audio tours and signage for those audio tours that went along with the installation, right? So it's a moment in which through the arts, you occupy public space for everybody to see and you then, you know, because that causes people to stop and say, what is this at the very least, right? You have created an opportunity to then maybe create curiosity and, and, and hear stories in this case, you know, in English and Spanish about, about the history of this place. Um, and so that was a very early project for me, but it's one that you will see, you know, some of those themes have carried along uh, and some of the techniques have sort of carried along as well um, in how art may not be using plants, right? But because it's out in the landscape, and is in public space, can tell stories about such landscape. Now moving to Western Massachusetts, this is an unveiled project though, uh, this, this part of it. I was working, I was uh, the artist in residence for the New England uh, Trail, which is part of the National Park Service. And I, in, initially they contacted me to do an art installation and I, I still would like to do this. I wanted to make a mountain um, out of mica. And for those of you who don't know what mica is, it's a, it's a, it's like a rock. It's a mineral. It can be mined, and it comes in sheets. And when you peel it, you can peel it, and then you get these like it almost feels like plastic. It's magical, but it's not. It's a mineral. It's what gets ground up, grounded to make your makeup, and it's in toothpaste. It's almost everywhere. Um, and I wanted to create this. I wanted to recreate. The sort of profile Where's the of a, remote. Give me that. <laughs> of a recognizable part of the Manholio range with with a stone. Um, unfortunately, that we did not have enough money to build it, but we did have funding and um, the support to do an outreach program uh, with some of the middle school students of Holyoke. Uh, which is a, a town in Western Massachusetts that has the highest concentration of Puerto Ricans outside of Puerto Rico um, and my Smith College students of the time. And so with, we worked together for a whole semester with this group of an after school program. And we decided to call attention, use art to call attention to this public uh, park and trail through the arts. So. Um, we took field trips to the park and then created artwork that was based on it uh, so that there would be like watercolors and paintings and drawings of what we saw. Uh, we met with geologists and botanists and went to the public library to also understand the cultural history of the place and then did an exhibition at the local library that as you can see, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very simplified mountain, but it's a mountain nonetheless made with the artwork 
uh, and the photographs of, of, of that project. And um, one of our nicest and, and most fun accomplishments was making this giant collage um, that was then used as the basis for a bus sign that we were able to place on our local bus for, uh, we were able to rent uh, that sign for about a month, right? So um, it, it has the intention of introducing residents who had never been to this park, right? Because there's a cultural, there, there are things that as a, as a recent immigrant, you may not be inclined to do. I am one of those. When I was growing up, I grew up during the 90s in Colombia when there was a drug war. And so <laughs> you just don't go walking on a mountain. You could get kidnapped, right? I mean, there's a, not everybody goes like hiking is a happy thing, right? And so if you're in a different country and you're coming from places that have been uh, experiencing war, <laughs> or, you know, in a more biodiverse places where there could be animals that can actually kill you, <laughs> you know, out there, you're less likely to go out and experience these things. And, and that is okay. But if you feel fine, then, you know, letting, having people experience this as public spaces that they can, they have the same access that anybody else, is an important thing to do. So that, that was sort of our goal. Like, inviting right making it accessible to um, a wider range of people and and doing so by working directly with this group of students for a whole semester and it was lovely because they came to our campus at smith in our classroom and we did work there and we went to their classroom and worked there and we went on field trips together to the park and to the library and then did the exhibit together so it was a really a, a sharing of experiences, which is something that I, I don't think we're doing enough of the going across socioeconomic uh, boundaries, right, in a genuine way. Um, and so I was really glad that we were able to do it. And, um, you know, of course, these things always call the attention of the mayor and the this and that and the press and blah, blah, well, great, fine. But, you know, and that's important, fine. But I think what's important is also and mostly is that we develop the ability to work together with people that are different than us. And having art as a way of doing that and having people see that what they make can be displayed as if it was a commercial sign is very powerful, right? Because how many people get to see that? How many times? I mean, what we are bombarded with is advertisement all the time. And knowing that you could also occupy that space for a different purpose and for a good purpose is a powerful thing. Um, since 2015, the my work has shifted and it wasn't unintentional. I did not wake up one day and say, I'm gonna do art about climate change. It just did not happen like that, but it happened. Um, and um, it happened sort of intuitively, accidentally, with a uh, proposal for a, an art piece for the Rose Kennedy Greenway, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and this was also a time in which it's old news by now, this you know issue of sea level rise, how it's gonna directly affect us. But many of us here in this audience remember when this was not a thing. It was not a thing. I went through graduate school and I never heard about sea level rise in my Harvard education in this century, <laughs> in this millennium. So for some of us, it may be a different experience than for some of you younger people in the audience. For some of us, it was a moment of like, what? Where did this come from? Like, how can this be real? You feel ashamed because maybe you were supposed to know. You feel surprised because you were generally did not know. And then you feel all kinds of feelings, sad, worried, all of it, right? When we first started, this was some of the earlier maps, right? That are sort of showing uh, potential um, flooding scenarios um, 
what year is this for 2100? And you're like, how can that be? And you look at those numbers and you're like, what do you mean? Four feet, five feet, 10 feet? Like, where's the grown up in charge kind of moment? Um, and of course, these things have become, you know, things that every year or every so often come back to the surface through storms like this. And so, I think all of that was percolating in the back of my head. And I think it was eliciting a lot of uncomfortable feelings and sad feelings. And I still, I'm, I still sit with those, right? Um, as I'm sure we all do. And, you know, the thinking of, 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 of being flooded or inundating or losing land, I think that all came together um, in my proposal for high tide, which was, as I said before, this was a, a call for a, a local for local artists to propose an artwork on the Rose Kennedy Greenway. And when I proposed High Tide, I thought about it in a more general way. I was thinking, well, I've always been curious about how when you draw a map of any continent or any country, you get that line that sort of marks the end of the land and the beginning of the ocean. And we've all been to the beach. That thing moves, <laughs> right? And the sense of in Boston's history, we know that that line has moved because we know that so much of the land that makes Boston used to be water, right? And now that we're also thinking that this, it's going to be, there's going to be flooding. Well, you can't help but wonder how that line is going to move again. So with this idea of like, how can I recreate this notion of a marsh during high tide? So that's sort of the, 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 what was happening back here. Um, and so as you can see, the location for the piece is um, do you see the Rose Kennedy Greenway highlighted with the green dotched uh, line and then the little tiny squid that is kind of getting hit? That's where this was because that was one of the sites selected by the Rose K uh, Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. As you know, or may know, or will know by now, uh, the Rose Kennedy Greenway is the linear park that was created as a result of the big dig, which was basically putting those gigantic tunnels that go uh, you know, a highway that was above ground was placed below ground uh, for cars to go to. So we have now in Boston this most beautiful set of parks. So High Tide was um, the, the the first, you know, it was an art piece that, you know, talk about this. And I like to give it some context. High Tide was exhibited before the Boston Climate Ready Report was published. So in a way, um, it's a small art piece. Most people don't know about it. Let's face it. I'm not like I'm that important. But just to just to put it into context about how I'm not making up that like we really didn't we were not talking about this. Like that the ways to communicating to the public that hmm, guys we're gonna flood. Oops, is rather new. And for me, as I said, I've been wanting to make water like all my life. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. And so the, the behind the scenes of this is, um, for those of you interested in materials, this are fiberglass rods. And I was, one night I was really grumpy. I don't know, you get those just like, ah, right? And I was watching TV and I, I don't know where, where I was. And I stumbled upon an Alexander Calder documentary. And as some of you know, Alexander Calder is known for his beautiful, mobiles right and as you know mobiles the way they work is you find the center of gravity and you know you basically balance if you imagine that i don't have a head and i just have a piece of thing that something whatever is in in this hand must weigh the same as it's on, on on this hand right and when you get that perfect perfect balance it's almost very free to move so I decided that I wanted that. I wanted this twinkly, watery, gorgeous space that would be made with dichroic plexiglass. And that's a dichroic is a dichroic film is a film that 
at a microscopic level is able to, you know how light has all the colors? This, you know, all the, all the wavelengths. This one lets some through and reflects others. So it changes the way that we perceive its color based on the direction uh, that the light is hitting it. So it's not like there's some pink uh, circles and some green circles and some blue circles. No, they're all the same. It's just the slight difference in how the light is hitting it. Um, and I was also interested in how do I use this artwork to create the illusion that this place is flooded and make that be a beautiful experience, right? This was the first and still probably my most effective attempt in using beauty without shame <laughs> to generate an emotion that is able to both attract you to the piece, capture, you know, this sort of moment of awe, right? And then deliver tough news, but hold you while you're delivering those tough news. And let's see, this is, this is a video with some stills and some, um, there's a, 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 some of the photograph. You see it, how it turns. It's a people took wedding photos here. Um, it was really unbelievable how that's my baby when he was a baby. <laughs> um, how how the public reacted, and because it was a Rose Kennedy Greenway, they were very interested in organic practices. So we decided to let the grass, the natural grass, grow, um, and then uh, it was beautiful to see birds perching on it and bees. So it almost became like a you know more lively march of sorts and. Um, you know, there were people that just basking in that colored light. Of course, there was the people that also decided to build teepees with it, but, you know, we didn't get a photo of them. Um, but the sense that of inspiring joy and inspiring uh, play as a, as, as a very intentional, you know, goal in my work is, is, is something that I really proud of and that I don't I don't want to lose um, the next project uh, future waters um, aguas futuras became a little bit more serious so this was yeah, by now this is much more intentional about calling attention to a specific risk of flooding in East Boston which as you will see here in these maps is one of the most vulnerable areas for flooding in, in, in Boston. East Boston is where Boston Logan, the airport is, right? And um, there's a greenway, the East Boston Greenway, which you see in a dashed uh, uh, white line. Uh, the, Bos the East Boston Greenway is essentially a vector for flood waters to come through because it sits lower than the rest. So these really fancy condos that they should have never built there. <laughs> it's almost like where the water's gonna come in and then it just goes up all the way through the, through the East Boston Greenway. So um, as you can see, this is what it looks like during um, a bad storm. And you know, East Boston is rapidly, rapidly gentrifying. Um, I think there was, I can't remember if there was a, an Amazon threat or something, but it, but in general, it's a, it's, a, it's a very quickly changing um, neighborhood. But it is it is still an environmental justice neighborhood. There is uh, low levels of education. There is a high immigrant population, refugee population, um, etc. Who again, going back to the topic of immigrants, right? You just landed in this place. You're making a living. Who has the time to even know or care or whatever that you're living in a land that is perhaps not, um, that is at a high risk for, for flooding. So it, you know, and it, what's interesting is that it's not that it's, nobody's talking about clearly East Boston it has its, you know, the Boston Climate Ready uh, report and the city are doing work in East Boston, but some of it, um, like this um, deployable flood wall, you know, in my experience as an artist, because my piece was placed not neat, not far from this, where this gate lives, where they're literally telling me, we're not even sure this is tall enough, <sighs> right? And so, you know, that's one of the beautiful things that um, my experience as an artist has afforded me to be part of those conversations on the ground with folks that 
are working in the area and are coming from different perspectives and then hearing those stories. And um, then it makes my work relevant, right? Because then I can say, all right, um, let's visualize what the flood levels for this particular location are going to be. And I've been very, very lucky to have uh, the friendship, I will say, from the folks at the UMass Boston Sustainable Solutions Lab, both the, Dr. Paul Kirshen, um, Chris Watson, and their team, who have generously shared their research with me, who I can say, Chris, can you get me the flood elevations for this place? And he gets them to me for this precise location for those years. That's really powerful. Right. And they are delighted. They are like, they feel like I'm the one doing them a favor because otherwise they know that whatever it is that they have will live in a chart and a report that the public is never going to see. Just because who goes home to read a planning report? No one. No one. Right. And so what we did here, we had a tiny budget, and that's why it's very crude. Right. I'm not like, hey, I do work with like chain link. But no, I mean, that's all we had. But we we were trying to create, again, water and trying to, and you'll see the video here shortly, to really give a height that you could put your body next to to understand what the risk of flooding is for this particular site. This is a video by one of my former students, um, my adore. <laughs> We tried many things with this project. Um, one of them was to use thermochromic pigments uh, to show changes in temperature. So thermochromic pigments, you may know from the spoons of, what is it, sweet frog? What is it called, you guys, you know it. That like frozen yogurt place? Come on! But you know what I'm talking about. Or like the water bottles, that isn't there a beer can? You know, this. Um, this is happened in November. It was not, that was not the goal, but that's when it happened. So we set it up so that um, we were visualizing uh, changes for 2030 and 2070, right? Both in like how much water there would be. So by 2030, we expect, you know, that the 1% chance flood, uh, it would be 2.3 2 feet. And by 2070, it would be five and a half feet. But also that, you know, the temperatures, you know, projected high for that would be 55 or 59. And so the idea that was that if we were to reach those highs, that would be the November high temperature for those years, the, the little balls that are those sort of like crystal plastic Christmas ornament balls that you see, the pigment that we coated them with would change from blue to pink or blue to purple. It kind of worked. But it really didn't because um, despite our best efforts to use a UV coating with a pigment, it didn't work. And those pigments are very sensitive to uh, ultraviolet light. And so the color got mucky. One of my students lovingly call it the booger colored <laughs> balls. But, um, but you, you do see that this is, this is a day where it was really, really cold. So you see that like a very, very deep blue, right? And so over, I don't know if you've noticed some of the other pictures, it hasn't been as blue. And so there's been some slight change. It just was not effective and not something that would like, oh, the balls are pink. Now it must be, you know, 60 degrees. We really did not succeed in that. Um, what we did succeed in doing was, you know, putting an art piece in the middle of the 
you know, a place where people are not going there to see the artwork, right? People are walking their dog, right? And so this is another strategy that art can accomplish, which is to put information that is specific to that place in a place that people visit it, right? So if you live in this neighborhood and you walk this dog and you see this and every day you're walking by something that's hitting, you know, mid-thigh, maybe at some point you're like, what is this? This wasn't here last week. You go read the sign and then you go, oh, right? Just a, it's a different way of experiencing this kind of information, right? And you're measuring it against your body. It also um, led to a young activist um, to sort of reach out to, you know, Representative Ayanna Presley and sort of, you know, kind of mention, you know, this installation shows how high waters in East Boston, you know, will rise in the coming years. I would drown, right? Something's five and a half feet and you're not that tall. At some point, yes, you would drown. And um, Representative Presley replied, which was like a big triumph for us. It sort of says like we created something with like $7,000 that eventually made it to you know the attention of somebody in Washington. That's cool, right? Because there's this sense of like, hey, what are you doing about this, right? In 2018, 19, that date is wrong. <laughs> in 2019, the following year, still in East Boston, um, we had a, a different project that was sort of like the follow-up, but it was it was not planned. This came out of a conversation from a computer science PhD student that walked into my office doing research for his advisor, and we struck a conversation, and they were trying to gather information about how people make decisions about public space, and I was just being nice, and, you know. <laughs> but before we knew it, we were like, what if we ask people how they feel about sea level rise and the risk of flooding in their neighborhood and what if we showed it so this was the first time and I don't know if there are any projects out there like that that'll be a good research question for us Jane um, to see if, um, if this project we not only visualize the threat right we were doing again the same thing this is how much is going to flood but we're also going to ask people how they feel about it and and show that so we did a whole project called uh, Rising Emotions, um, which was based on, on such a such idea, right? So we had multiple uh, working sessions with the nearby high school, um, high school groups, and with other members of that community and the public library, the East Boston Public Library, which is a fabulous place. Um, and, and, and we created postcards and not postcards, uh, business cards, which are really inexpensive and you can print a bunch of them that had a QR code. And we basically asked, you know, we kind of first asked, you know, don't assume that people know climate change. Don't, don't assume that people know that their neighborhood is going to flood. So we're like, did you know? <laughs> which is kind of like, oh, my God. right, that, you know, going to be affected by flooding and how does it make you feel? And so we, we we're had about 200 or 300, maybe 200 uh, participants over the course of a couple of weeks and you know and 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 we had this sort of major categories um one of the nice things about it was that in greatly in part because again we had no money to do this um we asked people not only how they felt about it but we left a prompt open so that they could actually write how they were feeling and then we had other folks transcribe that by hand onto these ribbons. Um, those ribbons, we actually had to cut ourselves at UMass, which was like the most, that was like the champion tedium, like now never again, people hate me for it. I mean, like I hate myself for having had that idea. But anyway, but it was cheaper. Um, but this idea that you're writing what somebody else felt about the risk of flooding, that's powerful. And that you're putting it out there for others to read which I think has now led me to kind of also begin to acknowledge and be curious about and owning the space in which art, one of the purposes of the art that I do is to process emotions and that that's a legitimate value in this type of work when we have something as scary as climate change lurking.
Um, we had multiple sessions and it was beautiful for me to be able to, even if it was for a couple of weekends, develop some relationship with the people that live here that come as regulars to this library and get a sense of what their lives are like. Like, why would this woman really have space in her day-to-day -day living to worry about, you know, climate change where she's just worried about getting her children fed and safe to and back from school, where she feels that she can't get a job because she still has to chaperone her daughter through like multiple subway rides to get her to school and back because she doesn't feel like it's safe enough for her. And because she can't get a job, then they're still like not financially secure. That's real, right? And for me, like I'm driving my little electric car all the way from Western Massachusetts to come do this and then I go back home. <laughs> That's like, I don't know what to do with that. You know, I, but I'm acknowledging it at least, right? So this is, um, as you can see, we had we had a really lovely time. We we reuse the uh, electric uh, conduit um, armature that we had for future waters, and this time we had the the flood elevation as we always do. But then we had our colored ribbons, which became duct tape. I still have a lot of colored full duct tape. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, duct tape on the um, on the sidewalk of the on the on the sort of front porch of the library, which um, towards the end you see became removable vinyl that went up the windows. Right. So again, it's like a very abstract way of making water. Right. We're walking in it, through it, and then up the window. It's very colorful. I told my kids, "Mommy's making a rainbow," and they loved the rainbow. Right, like I designed it so that kids could run underneath it because it is okay, even if we're doing about some work about something that's hard and difficult. That you're creating a space for the kid, for all the kids that can just run through the rainbow, right? And that's a legitimate um, service. These are some excerpts um, of, of 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 things that people wrote for you to get a, a get a feel for it. Take a sip of water. Um, I want to talk about my last project, um, which is the one that Will was mentioned. I just installed it um, this um, June. Future Shoreline was a, a, a much more adventurous uh, piece that um, aimed to both show um, different like levels of, of flooding but this time I got to make water on top of water, <laughs> right? I was like, oh, this is cool. I would wake up in the middle of the night, like, how am I going to float? I've never floated stuff. Why did I say I could do this? <laughs> um, anyway, so how it all worked out. Um, but at the time I was talking to the Boston Climate Ready folks and they're like, well, Carly, now that's great and all, but like, can't you make it optimistic? And I'm like, well, thanks very much. How am I going to make this optimistic? Uh, but they're like, oh, we have, we may have funding for a berm <laughs> and a long port point. Okay. So then it was interesting to me to think, okay, okay, okay. So we have water. We all know we have water. But like now there's a proposal to raise the land, right, to prevent floodwaters to come into this neighborhood. So then it occurred to me, well, can we begin to visualize it? Can we begin to imagine what six feet of earth is going to look like here, right? Because then it dawned on me, wait, wait, if this is happening here, how many hundreds, thousands, millions, I don't know, of miles of shoreline are going to be uh, modified for us to keep certain, you know, urban areas, you know, available for living. And how are we going to make choices about what gets done? How do we even begin to imagine what that is like? So that's, the, that's why the term future shoreline came from. It was like, wait, <laughs> this is not just here. I mean, yes, it is here, but it's everywhere. Going back to that issue of where is the line, right? Um, and so again, with our friends from the Boston Sustainable Solutions, uh, we were able to um, get those elevations. And these are... Uh, 
locally made in Massachusetts uh, lobster traps from a uh, beautiful uh, Riverdale Mills. Um, it's really, really beautiful. And I'll show you the video so that it tells the story. <laughs> This was during COVID. So you see, it's like super quiet. Those giant parking lots are empty. That's me, I'm a number two. She's so awesome. want to make sure you see all the credits because it, you know, these, when you show these projects, it's so easy to like stand here and make it sound like I did it all or it wasn't easy. And, and it just, it's not, it takes a village. It's really something, I know it sounds like the Oscars. I want to thank the da, 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 but it is so true. It is so true when you're trying to do anything um, that's different. There's not like, you can't Google, how do I make an art piece about coastal flooding in Boston? I mean, it's not, that's not a Googleable thing. It takes a process of building community to make these projects happen. Um, so, yeah, this, these are about 200 lobster traps. And as you saw from the video, the blue ones show the different, like three different levels of flooding in the water, and then those match whatever flooding would happen on land against a six foot proposed tall berm. And the idea is that like, at least on the land, you're able to walk by it and imagine it and picture yourself, you know, in it, kind of understand, like you see why, why the, that, why the berm is needed because you see it. And then you also see it in the water fluctuating with the tide, which is an important concept. Um, I think that all the awards also came from the video that my former student, those of you who were with Jane in class today, I don't know if some of you are here, Chris was my graphics one student. <laughs> and I love it. And it's been like 10 years or something since he was my student. And for me to like know that we can collaborate. Now he does this, it's really wonderful thing. Um, so the future, the future for my work in general, um, how do we, going back to the concept of home, you know, how do, how do we do work that takes care of our home, right? Our collective home for, for everyone, you know, what are the other things that we need to connect to? And, you know, for me, it takes multiple, <laughs> multiple uh, uh, sort of areas of focus, um, ideas about climate ad adaptation and mitigation, um, environmental justice. I have not done anything on climate migration, but I am ready because I think that even in the processing of emotions and in place attachment, there's a lot of work that art could do there in terms of getting people ready to connect to the future places where they will need to live because it just makes sense. And I think that for us as landscape architects, that could be something that we can contribute to. I haven't figured it out yet because I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> and listing of things that I need to do, but I, I have identified the potential, right? Um, I am lucky to work with the trustees of reservations every summer. I've been doing it for about four years uh, with their so, with their uh, high school group, the Waterfront Ambassadors. And so we've created sort of um, spin-offs, you may say, from some of my projects. You can see you know, the similarity between the rising emotions project of how does, you know, flooding make you feel. Uh, but, it, but with these students, what we did, and this is just a very small example, is just take the planning document, Climate Ready Boston, and have students, if have anybody, look through it as like, 
figure out how your neighborhood is going to be affected. Do you guys know how your parents, where your parents live, may be affected by climate change right now? Are you in an area that is at risk of flooding? Do you or your parents or grandparents live in an area where urban heat is worse than in others? Right? We may not know, but that information exists, right? So I'm like, what if you did a project where you you brought a brought that up? Right, and then share it with your friends, and then you get, how did you feel? Were you surprised, right? Um, and also doing work. This is uh, Nigel Cummings, a former student of mine, who uh, we used his um, master's project as an uh, inspiration for a project we did together, uh, which again in East Boston, which showed not only flooding, as you can see from the, the bottom blue, but also um, air pollution. We were he was able to work with a uh, Professor Michael Ash at UMass, who runs a database for the contaminants, air pollution contaminants, based on a database that shows the different schools in the state. So you can get that data of what's in the air. And so then if you then assign the different colors, then you'll be able to like know what's in your air. And ideally, you could compare. Right. So in terms of environmental justice, if you want to go to a school in a place that is next to a highway or a lot of industry, you could actually show what these children are breathing. Right. And this we design it with, you know, PVC pipe. Yes, not ideal. That's horrible, whatever. But it's inexpensive. But you can assemble it and assemble it. And tool which weighs nothing and costs nothing. And so you could do it. And you could do it. You could just stand there. You don't even have to ask for permission. Take a photo and then go. Right. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. My favorite unveiled project, call it this thing. Next year, I think. Heat trees. Um, it has been my first and only and unveiled <laughs> uh, project about urban heat. And when it's built, it's gonna be really beautiful. I think it's made out of nitinol, which is a smart memory alloy, which actually remembers its shape. So this tree will have leaves that will open up at different temperatures. Not that it's like, wow, they're all going to pop up and it's going to be magical. No, it's like a leaf, kind of like our trees. We're like, I need a little water. And it goes like, this. oh, I'm fine. Yeah. But it's still the idea of creating a sculpture that is responsive to heat. Um, I've had lots of issues with it. I canceled the project because I am still conflicted about spending fifty, sixty thousand dollars in a sculpture where we could just be buying air conditioners for the people that are suffering the health effects of you know heat because heat is a money problem. People that are wealthy and have air conditioned homes in leafy suburbs are not dying because of heat. So I've discovered unintentionally a blind spot in our kind of uh, the way that we're paying attention to urban heat and, and I'm, I'm struggling, but it will happen, stay tuned. This is my pitch to the Rhode Island folks, <laughs> William, Richard, Jane, somebody in this room. So we had some leftover lobster traps from when we installed Future Shoreline and one of our um, sort of team members that has worked with me for many, many years, uh, his parents have a home and somewhere in Massachusetts, I think it's Swampscott, not Swampscott, Swansea. Oh God, it's embarrassing. Anyway, and um, you can see over time, he's used it along the sort of the coastal area where there used to be Spartina. And over several months, it's it, it served well enough as a breakwater to allow the grass to come back. So we're really thrilled. It's been like now a year and a half. And I, I don't even have more recent pictures, but I, I have been in, in communication with Ian. He said it's doing great. So we're looking for land to put this, to kind of continue to test it. Currently, these traps are in Chelsea, serving a different purpose for a pop-up park, because that way to park them there after being used for the project in Fort Point. But after seeing this, it is in my heart. I would love to kind of continue this work for both its marsh restoration purposes, but also for like aesthetics 
some of the traps, not these blue ones, but the yellow ones are a lot stronger. So you could walk on them and sit on them. And I think it could be a really interesting way of testing how you could still provide some user friendly, you know, get close to the marsh that's being restored. Right? Yes. You see it? Click. All right. Sold. You're on it. <laughs> it's been hard, right? Like I'm trying to do good and I'm finding out that doing good is very tricky. I'm not saying that like the world's against it. No, I'm just saying whew, it's not straightforward. But um, I, I'm, I'm very much uh, excited to be able to pursue this idea. So I'm, I'm, any help that you can provide would be greatly appreciated. With 20 seconds left, Farley, I talked too long. Uh, I just want to thank you for being here tonight. I want to encourage you to reach out to me to drive up to UMass if you can, say hello. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here and I would love it if you happy to answer some questions or, or continue the conversation afterward if it's too late. Thanks so much. I talked long. I was worried I was gonna be short because last time I did this, I was too short, but you guys are such a friendly audience. Just kept going, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody go be the guy. <laughs> this is great. Thank you very much for your, your talk. And I was cutting down that I'm going to uh, add your name to the climate activist group uh, because I think yes. I'm thinking of all of the people that I could send this to. Yes. Uh, because between, between the materials, in industrial design or our TMD department, and just looking at um, the the um, cluster hot item, it seems like there are all of these opportunities. Yeah, this one especially has Rhode Island could be its home. So I think it's great, and I, I really thank you for for presenting these to us and to our students because our students are working on climate related problems and they hear of the doom and gloom. Yeah. Um, but this is provide some opportunities to plan ahead. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Student first. Yeah, um, some are very short. Um, some are very short, maybe a month, because insurance for public card has become crazy expensive. So some of those projects have such a tiny budget, like $7,000, and then like say 1500 is going to insurance. You just can't afford to have them there for longer. Now, Future Shoreline and its original uh, shape lasted for almost two years. And in part, it was because we installed it during COVID in October. Um, and I was not carrying the insurance. The insurance was being carried by the Four Point Arts uh, community. So, and it was fine and nothing happened to it. So, okay, just leave it out there. Um, but in general, they're very short lived. And, but I would say mostly because of insurance. Yeah. When you're a public artist, like in a way, everything is against you. You know, like you can't think about it like that because then you actually won't get anything done. But all the, you know, you have, when you, you write, a, if there's a contract, you're like, well, is this going to withstand the winds and, and storms and, you know, snow? And um, I could give talks on projects that have broken, <laughs> you know. Um, and then people, there's always like, what are people going to do with it? Are they going to ruin it? Like this vandalism, you know, like, you know, people in public space. And I'm like, I know people in public space, but I am, I believe in humanity and my projects have never been vandalized. Maybe, I don't know. But, or like, whatever, you know, you put something out there like, okay, well, here we go. But, but there are all those logistical aspects. And I still, but mostly is lack of proper funding. And I am still in it. God, it's so hard. I just want to say thank you very much because this, this to me is a good 
shows how art leads the way in all scientific kinds of uh, mm -hmm. directions, mm -hmm. and that art becomes part of design and becomes a team effort to set the focus of the measurements of what are the ramifications of this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think this is this is wonderful. I think this should be. This should be shown to a uh, one on one students. Mm -hmm. It should be shown to uh, uh, 445 students. And you just showed it to most of our 444 students. So, um, you know, this, this is just phenomenal the impact that you've made this evening uh, to our department. Uh, uh, it's really quite wonderful. And, uh, and cost. Seems minuscule for a teaching device. And I think that's, that's pretty remarkable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. Yes. I have a question from. Oh, I um, love it. We're now going worldwide. Go. <laughs> what are some of the most valuable things you learned in graduate school in your formative learning years that have helped you generate and figure out your own? <sighs> I was lucky. Oh my God, not, I love you, GSD landscape folks, but I learned more in the architecture classes that I took in at the GSD in my graduate school because at the time that I was there, um, there were at least two or three very influential people Toshiko Mori, Monica Ponce de Leon, and Michelle Addington, um, who were doing a lot of experimental work around materials. And so with Toshiko Mori, who was then the chair of the architecture department, I took one of her classes. She didn't want to let me in, so I just kept showing up. I was that kid. I so wanted to be in her class. I know, right? And you know what we did that whole semester? We built a wall out of laminated toilet paper. It was magical. The GSD was so cheap that they didn't even get the perforated toilet paper, which was great because then it was stronger. So we figure out how to laminate. We use starch like for ironing, right? So like layers of toilet paper. And we had to put it over like aluminum flashing with Pam spray so it wouldn't get stuck. Yeah. Then we ironed it. Then we cut it and like, kind of like, you know how you cut half of the paper on one side and half of the other and then like wedge it in? So we wove it. And it was like this. We spent a whole semester figuring out how to get a wall of toilet paper. Like it was like laminated, right? But it was sheets of it, like built on top of it. How do we get it to like stand up so that it could be this tall thing that we could take to an exhibit? That experience has not left me because it's like, you can't Google, how do I make a wallet of to let me do it? You can't. You just have to go through the failure, humiliation, ridiculousness of it all to try to make something that has not been done before. Right? And it's just a beautiful experience. Um, that and Michelle Anikun with her class on smart materials. She's my hero. She's a beautiful lady. Um, I am this nine old business of the leaves that open and close. That is coming from that class, which I took more than 20 years ago. And I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> so, yeah, so, some of that, I, I, you know, kind of going into new things. That was it. More? More, 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 more. Um, have you experienced any feedback from policymakers in views where your installations occur? I don't. And that's a big, uh, let's say like policymakers, they love it. They're like, oh, yes, can we put our name with it? And I'm like, sure. And I feel only bored on going and sitting with meetings with them. It's like, I'm someone. But I've been very frustrated um, in the Rising Emotions Project. I felt that it was wrong to us people. Hey, your neighborhood's going to flood. How do you feel about it? Okay, cool. Bye. Right? That's not nice. So. I can't, you know, I didn't want to leave people just hanging. Like I came, I asked you how you felt, you pour your heart out. I made a project so that eventually, you know, we can talk about it and we all feel like, oh, that's so nice. But then, you know, bye, you're on your own. I felt that it was important to try to connect it to something positive. And so can we link, you know, what can you do? 
What am I going to tell people? Change your light bulb? Right? It's not enough. I mean, this is the moment of <laughs> And so can we connect to uh, uh, ongoing planning efforts or uh, grassroots organizations? And so we contacted them and they said yes. But when we had the public meetings, there wasn't the enthusiasm. Like there wasn't, they're like, yes, no. And so I'm curious about that. It's not like, oh, people are horrible and they don't really want participation. I don't want to make that assumption, but I also know that it is hard. And I'm thinking something is missing here. Do, and, and it's one of the things um, I talked to Jane talk about this. I worry sometimes, and I'm, I mean, I'm trying not to be paranoid about this, but I worry sometimes that art like this can be used to give the illusion that we're doing something when we may not. And so in my stage of a career right now, that's why I'm interested in, like, this seems to be working. Let's do something, right? <laughs> to be as impactful as I can. And so I'm paying attention. I was like, hey, that felt funny. Was it me? Or is it really like nothing is happening? Like, what are these decisions? Like, how are we really empowering the community? And I, I'm a little naive and optimistic. So like, I'm trying to, like, come out of that and still not lose it. It's complicated. but. Yes. So now I'm thinking, should we then start with potential policies that need to be implemented and then we can just use the art to make those things happen, right? How do I position myself to create the, the greatest impact? Because otherwise it's just exploiting those communities. And I'm not going to do that. That's why I almost I canceled that heat tree project. I'm not going to go there so that other folks come and like say, oh, well, how wonderful. Like we sponsored that or we made that happen. Bye. And then there's still some grandmother in some apartment, you know, suffering because she's too hot. That's not cool. So it's complicated. That's the answer. Are we done? Is that good? Long night. Yes. Email me if you have any questions. Come say hello at your mouse. Thank you so much. Do good work. Thank you.